Hello and welcome to another episode of Strategic Dialogue uh, that I bring to you in association with USI, India's oldest military think tank, uh, which is now celebrating its 150 years. Uh, we continue our conversation regarding strategic uh, issues of uh, immense importance, which come in the background of uh, and the backdrop of the Galwan Valley clash, uh, the present Indo-Chinese equation, and more importantly, is there now finally a realization in New Delhi that uh, India needs to now deal with the twin challenges of Pakistan and China together and not view them separately as it has been doing so for so many decades. Joining me in this conversation is uh, Major General B.K. Sharma, uh, who is the director of USI. And besides that, a keen China watcher, somebody who understands the region very well. Uh, also in the conversation is Lieutenant General Harish Tukral. Uh, he's um, been the defense attache to Pakistan and understands what really is Islamabad and more important, importantly, GHQ Rawalpindi thinking as far as New Delhi is concerned. Okay, first things first, uh, thank you so much gentlemen for joining me in this conversation. Thank you. Uh, thank you ma'am and I also thank uh, uh, the director of USI for giving me this opportunity uh, to share my perspective on this very, very uh, burning topic uh, uh, today. Uh, General Sharma, let me start with you, sir. You know, while we all know the friction points that exist between Indo and Pakistan, India and Pakistan, and I'm going to come to that in a bit, but first up, you know, as far as the sino indian relations are concerned, there are multiple friction points that exist. And, you know, when you talk about these areas of contestation, how do you view them? And how many in your assessment are there actually right now? present that New Delhi needs to deal with and tackle uh, going forward. Uh, thank you, Gauri. Uh, uh, I would propose that uh, in terms of these uh, friction points, I would talk about Ladakh and Northeast. And uh, General Tukral has been the General Officer Commanding in Sikkim. And also he's been General Officer Commanding looking after the central sector. So he may be better informed to deal with these two sectors. Mm -hmm. So coming to Ladakh, as we know, the situation there is that uh, <clears throat> they are very much there in Dapsang Valley in large number. Uh, some partial disengagement has taken place in Galwan, Gogra, Hot Spring area, though there is a friction point in uh, patrolling point of Gogra, 17 Alpha, where the disengagement is not taken place and they have dug in their heel in the area of fingers. So where do we go next? And the further buildup is taking place as we know. So where we go from here? See, Chinese have number of options if they have decided to press on and do not disengage and de-escalate. They could make a push in Dapsang Valley further. And uh, that is one area because not too many clashes have taken place there. And second area that they could open is in the area of uh, Chumar, Damchuk. There is a place called Spangur Gap, you know, which is very close to Chashul. So these are the new areas, friction points. At the moment, I don't think Chinese will attempt this because whatever political objective they wanted to achieve, that they have been able to achieve, but should India do something in turn, then there is a possibility of them opening other areas and we should be prepared for that. Now, what are other options there? Probably that we can discuss mm. subsequently. How do we yes. re restore this situation? In mm. regard to Northeast, uh, as we know that their main uh, military and political objective there is Tawang. But Tawang is very well defended there. Uh, we have what you call the wall of Tawang. But in Tawang, there is an isolated sector called Mago sector in which there is a disputed point called Yangtze. And that particular area is today air maintained. And since their infrastructure is very well developed on the other side, so this is an, another area where they could foment some kind of a trouble. And the most important here is the five valleys in rest of Arunachal Pradesh, what we call is RAL. 
and these valleys are sabansari siam siang dabang and lohit valley and in sabansari valley there is a contested area or disputed area called asafila and in another valley which is called dabang there is an area called fish tail now these are disputed areas and again they have very well connected network from their deeper roads into the border areas here whereas our connectivity is not so well developed so we have to be on our guard and i'm sure we would have taken certain preemptive actions to plug in certain vulnerabilities there so that chinese are not able to cause another friction point and try and sort of uh, uh, embarrass us there mm. so these are the other areas and i would request uh, general thokral to talk about central the sector and, and uh, the central sector. sector yeah the yeah. central sector yeah yes general thokral uh, right i think uh, you know uh, this recent incident which has happened uh, it has to be seen uh, in a in a in a slightly uh, bigger perspective uh, to understand the core reasons why uh, why china has done what it has done now you know uh, this uh, uh, raising the belligerence level all across the uh, uh, borders of india with with uh, with uh, china uh, marks a radical shift in the in the role of the dice uh, by the pla and the uh, and the chinese uh, cmc now why i say that is uh, that because you know we have seen over the past uh, two months large number of experts both of indian origin as well as of uh, of, of the world uh, uh, putting forth a large number of reasons uh as to why china has uh, has gone this belligerent now to my point of view uh, the one single reason which is very important to understand uh, is abrogation of article 370 okay. and what that article's abrogation meant uh, in its military implications right now 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 this military implications if we don't uh, you know de de delve on we will not be able to really uh, uh, understand the whole game of china and china as we all know what it puts into the show window is seldom that commodity which it wants to sell so mm. from my point of view uh, as far as uh, as far as uh, china is concerned our policy has been basically very simply put three pronged that is uh, uh, to uh, compartmentalize all the issues mm. and uh, secondly uh, prevent conflicts or disputes in becoming conflicts mm. and thirdly hope uh, uh, that the peace dividend or the resultant peace dividend of having tranquility and peace right. on the borders and making progress on the other issues uh, to be able to solve the border issue in some later time frame well, chukral i'm going to come to the indian strategy and whether it needs a reset in just a bit but before okay. that sir just just for our for the benefit of our viewers Uh, yeah. the area in you know the central sector that you think are areas of contestation where there is a possibility of a flare up if you could just take us through those okay uh, the in the central sector if you want to uh, have specifics then there is a area which is north of uh, north of uh, nelang in the harsil sector mm -hmm. uh, which is known as palam sunda now this is a area in the central sector which uh, Uh, where the chinese claim about uh, 1400 square kilometers of uh, area on differing perceptions of the lse this is one of the flare up points and uh, recent reports have also indicated that there is some concentration of Pakistan, of of uh, of the pla opposite this sector the second and more important and more uh, uh, conspicuous area of uh, of uh, of uh, which is contentious between uh, between india and china <coughs> is the barahoti bowl which is which is uh, uh, which is uh, traditionally be being claimed by uh, by china with a, with a area of about 750 square kilometers okay. hmm. now in the central sector otherwise the central sector has been uh, traditionally very benign and hmm. very tranquil and china basically uses this sector to to convey its responsible image to the world and to india that it is keen to solve the border disputes this is the only sector where both countries have shared 
their perceptions of the LSE with each other. Okay. But these are the two areas which are which are important. Uh, mm-hmm. In 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 the Sikkim sector, uh, again the boundary is uh, boundary issue is more or less settled because the watershed is quite easily definable there and uh, the delineation is possible. Mm. But recently, the the uh, the Nakula sector, which flared up, where there was a face-off and a very very belligerent face-off, that is an important area for the PLA because getting hold of that area gives its uh, give the gives the PLA an opportunity to to make make uh, make uh, ingress into our area and cut off our defenses uh, in that area to some extent. Uh, there is another. Uh, uh, an area where where possible flare up can happen is is the finger area on the plateau now mm. this finger is not the same finger as we see in the uh, pengongso uh, area but the name nomenclature is the same this is also an area which the chinese have uh, claimed uh, uh, in the for uh, quite consistently over the last four decades and there are large number of face offs and standoffs and incursions uh, which happen in this area so these four uh, areas are such where you can expect a flare up but i okay. also feel that the recent uh, uh, recent uh, uh, actions at uh, lipu lake by nepal hmm. where they have uh, you know uh, enlarged their uh, uh, their territorial boundaries and their territorial areas uh, on the lipu lake pass as well as going all the way westwards up to up to uh, lumpia dhura now this is another place that uh, that PLA, if it starts to make ingress from okay. Lipu Lake Since, eastwards, okay. it, can, it can actually cause uh, some uh, anxiety to us. So, which brings me to ask the question, and you know, this I, I, I put forth to both of you, is that when you have possibility of flare-ups on multiple such uh, areas, then how do we go about minimizing them? Because, you know, I don't think that you can absolutely remove the possibility of a flare-up, General Sharma, but how do you minimize that, especially in the wake of what happened at Galwan Valley? What can be done? You you, you take us through that, sir. See, uh, uh, I think we are more than prepared now to prevent Galwan-like incidents uh, because uh, China has shown its hand at least, and we would have taken certain preventive actions. The first and foremost thing is, how do we restore status quo anti in Ladakh sector if China doesn't willingly withdraw through negotiation? And we want to confine the whole conflict to the that sector itself, and we don't want to proliferate it to other sector. Then we may have options of holding them wherever they made these... Uh, contestation. And there are other areas where we could probably go and sit behind, you know, five to 10 kilometers inside using our special forces and some of our forces and give a fate accompli to Chinese. Mm. But Indian government by design is not resorting to this kind of option for the simple reason that we do not want war to escalate. But if push comes to the shock, and there is no other option, then this option can be exercised, right? Then in other areas, no, there is very well-defined levels of preparedness we have at the border. Initially, uh, we have a border management posture. Mm -hmm. Depending on some indicators of enemy activities, we call it as an enhanced border management posture. And then we have a hot war deployment. And how do you, you know, trans, transgress or I would say you transfer from one to another is based on what you call is the battle indicators. And those battle indicators are based on your intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance capability. When you see the enemy build up, you automatically graduate to the next level. And then what you do, you address some of the unheld areas and lightly held areas where our deployment is not too much. And then also you have the, what you call is the rapid reaction forces, which are acclimatized and which can restore adversity and which if need be, can also take the battle into enemy territory so that at the negotiation table, you're, you know, you're quite confident to deal with them from a position of strength. 
Mm. I'm sure that all these actions India has already taken and it is more than prepared uh, for uh, any further uh, eventuality that may crop up. Con concurrently with this is more important is to build up our air degradation capabilities because all the build up of forces that will take place through these highways if we are able to cause attrition to their follow up echelons and they are not able to build up the war stamina then that is uh, uh, you know what is needed but more important that i see is now that probably we are for a long and long haul here chinese are not showing any indicators to withdraw so we have to probably go for a winter deployment of a large number of troops how tough will that be sir have, how tough yeah, will for that which, be uh, yeah for which we have to have a sustainable logistic build up so that our forces can sustain because there is a critical window before yes. the onset of winters when chinese may do something nasty and then the winter sets in and we are not left with any option so all these contingencies i can tell you with some degree of confidence would have been worked out and we are not in for another surprise from china okay that's 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 a very important point you've made uh, then let me then ask you this fact that the chinese are also now relying increasingly on the fact that the china pak nexus that has been on not for now but for decades we all know the proliferation of nuclear technology that happened how pakistan has got nuclear weapons so on and so forth but the fact is now it has reached a state where india will have to be completely prepared general sharma i want to first ask you this question about the two front war that we's been talked about for the last so many years but is now a reality that we need to be completely prepared for and then i get in uh, general tukral as well on what is it that not islamabad but rawalpindi is thinking but yes general sharma first see from our perspective there are a range of options which pakistan could exercise the first option is probably there could be a thinking that uh, they are not in a position to open another frontier because of their internal dynamics and whatever is going on in pakistan so one option is keep your responses limited to infiltration mm. and go for a hedging strategy that means you take a defensive strategy along the lac this is option 1 option 2 with them is together with chinese go for very sensational kind of terrorist strikes what happened at palwama and puri and now put the ball in indian court to respond now you india is on the horns of dilemma if you respond what we did during balakot they will put the whole blame on india that we opened the second front right and if it, india doesn't respond then they will say india is weak and it could not size up to any provocation from pakistan and all this bala court and it was a hollow talk third thing is together with chinese they could go for some nibbling actions that means some of the important posts in northern ladakh or elsewhere in in the uh, loc sector they go, could go for nibbling action and they could provoke you and the last which is a worst case scenario with a wink from chinese they could open another front in ladakh wherein they can muster sizable forces and while chinese are making a push through eastern ladakh they could also come from the northern ladakh and have some kind of a confluence or convergence of the two thrust lines of all what i feel is probably if i was there in pakistan i would confine myself to some palwama like uri like sensational strikes and hit up the line of control without getting fully embroiled in a conflict with india general tukran what I'm do you sure... think yeah uh, you know in uh, pakistan as a country or pakistan military to be uh, precise was actually uh, totally uh, taken aback by this abrogation of article 370 and its image in pakistan took a very very uh, intense beating now linking from there that uh, 
and and which totally controls the narrative in pakistan it is uh, it has propped up a, a a civilian government which cannot do without its support all the strategic decision making which was always in the hands of the pakistan army now even domestic decision is totally controlled by the pakistan army so when such a thing happens and it is not able to mount an effective and a powerful response to the abrogation of article 370 the army gets a little jittery and why does it get jittery is because today pakistan army's main role or any army's main role is basically to safeguard the sovereignty of that nation but in pakistan the role of the army because of its economic interests mm. has got so entangled with the with the political uh, uh, class as well as with the economic interests that uh, any uh, any dilution of that role uh, makes the pakistan army extremely sensitive when its image takes a beating and it is not able to do anything about it it actually uh, comes to a conclusion that uh, that what pakistan prime minister is repeatedly saying both from the portals of the parliament as well as in the ghq that india will launch a false flag operation so it is mortally scared at this point of time that the belligerence or the or the escalatory ladder on which india has uh, has uh, indicated that it will not shy away from climbing especially after the balakot strikes especially after reiterating its claim of retaking pok pakistan army feels that indian army can at any point of time of its own choosing can push the loc westwards mm. the view to take away or take up sensitive strategically important areas which will strengthen the indian army's uh, overall position on the loc now if that happens then the pakistan army's image will even take a further beating and if that image takes a further beating then its economic interest also get impacted and quite adversely absolutely but Believe then you know general chukra let me ask you this you know from a from a uh, layman's perspective for the benefit of our viewers you know just to uh, simplify it even now in the midst of the corona induced slowdowns the world is facing there have been 11 billion dollars worth of deals that have been signed between china and pakistan in the cpec corridor gaining and and giving an insight into the fact that this corridor is going to now get a further thrust from the chinese indicating that they're going to try and ensure that they further build up the psychological pressure as far as the two front war that has been talked about i want to understand from you sir that the possibility of such an escalation in the backdrop of a what happened at kalman and b of course also that you know you have the first anniversary of article 370 abrogation that you spoke about at the beginning of this conversation see cpec actually is one of the leverages which many in the world feel that that china has that leverage over uh, pakistan but of late when the whole pakistan experts are actually uh, highlighting the negative impact of cpec on pakistan and it is going to enter a uh, enter the deepest debt trap which it is uh, seen for many years cpec has given pakistan army a reverse leverage over the pla because cpec is one of the crown jewels of this uh, of one uh, this bri network and if cpec doesn't work well the chinese investments which have been of immense uh, Uh, uh magnitude in pakistan are all going to go uh, into a very risky profile so pakistan army at the moment holds immense leverage over the pla and that is why pakistan chief of army staff is going overboard in ensuring and propagating from all platforms that uh, that cpec uh, and its security its projects and investments will remain secure they have recently appointed one of the most uh, uh uh you can say uh uh sought after generals of the pakistan army uh, as its uh, as a cpex chairman and uh, and also raised a big uh, uh, 15000 uh, worth uh, force to guard the cpex corridor all along yes. from kashgar down to down to gwadar 
so from this angle what i am stating is that that pakistan today has got uh, a dish on its plate which is fully delicious sino indian conflict and to say that pakistan army will not exploit this particular uh, particular uh, you know uh, possibility uh, possibility is going to be actually naive thinking so pakistan is a very very opportunities opportunistic opportunistic state and it can do it in many ways however when you see it in the full context as far as china is concerned a prolonged stalemate on the border will actually suit its maximum interest however if india takes a misstep and decides to take any escalatory step that will be actually immediately violently and very very uh, uh, in a in a planned manner retaliated by by china because that is why they have they have uh, amassed their forces all uh, all the yes. segments of the border that is western front central front and the eastern front before taking these incidents in in ladakh they have actually minimized their vulnerabilities doklam was one of the vulnerabilities of china which they have now minimized nakula mm. was one of the vulnerabilities which they have minimized yes. ritu lake was one of the vulnerabilities they have minimized in ladakh all across the ladakh place or ladakh border wherever they had even a minutest of um, vulnerability they have very very meticulously minimized it so okay. to say that Uh, quid pro quo can go very easily is 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 uh, is is in the plans there are many many opportunities but it is going to be a very very considered very mm. very important decision because the moment we go up the escalation ladder that gives the chance for pakistan to jump in the fray and then it has got a plethora of uh, canvas to it can make uh, more uh, uh, terrorist attack in the valley yes. it can i can uh, heat up the loc have a collusion easily but any chance of collusion in northern ladakh and if any collusive action takes place and we are mildly surprised also those gains cannot be offset by uh, by by very easy means in pakistan who okay. is that so uh, collusion then let me let me then ask this to both of you that you know uh, we are speaking now when the first anniversary of article 370 abrogation is is taking place it's been a year since the historic decision it was very tough for both china and pakistan to absorb or digest they've gone to un and raised it on multiple occasions and all platforms general sharma that if a year has gone past are we then to believe that maybe the most violent reaction that could have been anticipated from china and hence pakistan is now almost done or should we still prepare for maybe more of that given that across western europe and even in us there are a whole host of rallies and protests that are being funded and put forth by the pakistanis even now so oh, see there is a 19 point program which uh, prime minister uh, imran khan has already made right mm. and they are not going to let go this so easily particularly when india is beset with the major border challenge with uh, china so we should expect more and more uh, rhetoric and also some concrete actions from pakistan because what do they prove to the people of kashmir and to rest of the world and probably this is the best window available to them uh, to do something and therefore we should be more than prepared for any contingency be it a sensational terrorist strike or be it some kind of a trouble they would they would like to create at the border a uh, two front war for us is a reality and if you permit us maybe i'll tell you what are the steps that we need to take uh, sure. you know to address some of these uh, weaknesses sure. that we have so should i should i continue sure. yeah yeah please yeah so you see first and foremost thing is that there was a, a problem between uh, different segments of our policy makers here whether two front is a reality or it is a myth whether china is a military threat there were people who said yes china doesn't war uh, won't war with india now these kind of assumptions have been put to rest and what we need to recognize 
for good is the two front in the times to come is a reality and therefore we need to have credible veteran stroke war fighting capability and now what needs to be done rather than resorting to these knee jerk reactions and going for these emergency acquisitions and things like that we need to now address the operational hollowness which has built into our land forces over a period of time in terms of uh, critical deficiencies of equipment ammunition spare parts and things like that we have to build up this logistic capability for winter deployment of additional troops which is not an easy task you know to yes. maintain one brigade size force in siachen it requires a lot of effort and now to have 35000 people living in sub zero temperature it's a colossal task which needs to be met concurrent with this i my confidence level as far as ground force is concerned is quite high concurrent with this we need to have a anti axis anti denial strategy towards china what they have been doing against the united states of america and here we have to have deep penetration and deep strike capability in terms of induction of more rafale Mm. and s400 because unless you are able to interdict their highways you know the all yes. the highways which are coming south of sangpo river or the western highway shikwane this uh, negari access you know so uh, if you do not have the wherewithal your weapons your intelligence surveillance reconnaissance and targeting capability how are you going to fight them you're not going to fight them only at the tactical level about 8 to 10 kilometers yes those capabilities need to be built up mm. sooner or later indian ocean region is going to hit up because that is where we have a competitive advantage and therefore we need to have some kind of a anti denial capability so that the chinese navy is not able to cross indian indonesian archipelago strait of malacca and some yes. of these other states and come into the indian ocean for which we need to build up our anti submarine warfare capability mm. anti ship ballistic missile anti ship cruise missile capability mm. then you know we had put this mountain strike core on a back burner there was so much of flip flop whether we need it we do not need it and we lot lost lot of time it is high time that we revisit and that to very very seriously creation of a mountain strike core it can be a discussion by itself what should be the form of mountain strike core whether we need one two that's a discussion by itself but a mountain strike core has become an inescapable operational requirement today yes then the larger issues are that we've been grappling with this national security strategy a joint military strategy mm. and a theaterization which will foster integration and jointness and synergy these are the steps which have to be put on a fast footing and to be done on an accelerated manner so that we can take a holistic view and not look at this as one episode but a long term strategy absolutely deterrence and war fighting both against china and pakistan and pakistan and for absolutely. that la last point is no matter what happens even if we have to eat only the salt and you know roti but we should not uh, curtail our uh, defense budget because everything depends on and i was coming to just that money. as a wrap up that the fact is out of 71 billion dollars which was in 2019 a lot goes into routine expenses very limited is left for big purchases like rafal add to it the economic crisis that we are facing and most people now or analysts expect that the defense budget may actually cut down uh, going forward and uh, in such times remains to be seen how it will impact our defense uh, preparedness and our uh, overall capabilities uh, thank you so much uh, general sharma as well as uh, general tukral for taking out the time in this uh, conversation the attempt being to declutter and simplify what really is happening on our borders and the larger strategic issues that frankly all of us now need to be seized of thank you so much for joining in this conversation hosted by me in association with usi Thank you madam thank you thank you so much thank you